Awesome. Good morning. Great standing room only crowd in the back. There are some seats up here if you want to come up. You won't disrupt my comments. CNP, thanks for the great intro and opening remarks. Uh, I wanted to talk to the crowd perhaps about some things that you know, but I want to touch on uh, exactly what we do in PERS 4. And uh, as you know, there's, uh, we kind of flooded the market here. We've got 31 of our detailers and placement coordinators here interspersed amongst the crowd. So great opportunity to interact directly face-to-face -face with those detailers and placement coordinators. So please take full advantage of that. There's booths in the back and uh, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you about a bunch of topics and uh, explain the process from our perspective in PERS 4. And it's also probably a good opportunity to give a pitch to you. For those of you that have worked there, you know that it's a challenging job. For those of you that you haven't worked there, I would tell you it's a place to, that you want to go. And you want to understand this process crystal clear. It'll make you a better leader. It'll make you better as far as writing evaluations and fit reps. It'll make you a better commander uh, across the board. Next slide, please. So there's a struggle going on in Millington, if you, if you think about it. We've got a series of customers that we uh, have to serve. First and foremost, the customer is our nation and our Navy, right? But at a little lower level, the customers are the units that we're sending sailors to, and that's a placement officer or placement coordinator function. And then there is the sailor aspect, and that, that's the struggle. So those two kind of meet at the placement coordinator and the detailer point of view, right? We try very hard to meet sailor needs, uh, but we can't always meet sailor needs. So I would ask you, what do you think is more important, sailor choice or needs of the Navy? I didn't hear anybody say sailor choice, but this crowd was pretty unanimous over here as needs of the Navy. As a former placement officer, I would tell you that needs of the Navy takes precedence. And so that, that struggle goes on um, continuously. So next slide. This talks a little bit about the distributable inventory. So if you look at the slide, you see the big blue pie, and the, the pies aren't necessarily to scale. But the big blue pie over on the left side of this slide is all of our enlisted force. At any given time, uh, there's roughly 38,000 of the force that are non-distributable, which means we can't detail them. They're in training. Uh, they might be patients. They might be in some so, uh, sort of holding or transient kind of thing. But that's generally the bulk of that is folks that are in training. So they're not filling uh, roles uh, in our detailing ability. And then there are two other categories, the green and the uh, kind of the pinkish there. Uh, those are limitations and considerations. Considerations are not that big of a restriction to us, really. That involves principally co-location issues and exceptional family members. And we've got policies that we work very, very hard um, to meet the needs of sailors for their families or for co-location purposes. And I will tell you, if somebody's going to say no to that, that no is at my desk. So it doesn't happen at a lower level with the detailers. You should all understand that that happens at the first flag in the chain, OK? And I get those packages periodically. And, and Al will tell you, PERS 40 here, will tell you that, I mean, I ask tough, tough questions in every one of those. I mean, I want us to find a way to yes, but what we won't do is we won't send a sailor to a made-up billet uh, or double stuff somebody. We'll send a sailor to a, a, a needed billet that fills a need in the fleet, but we're not going to just make up a, a job, okay? But we, I'm very committed to meeting those. Uh, the limitations, uh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the limitations, the pink, that's another slice of the, the population of sailors that we have that we really can't distribute. We only really, the only ones I'd really even mention are, are a pretty big chunk, and it adds up to about 8,000 at any given point in time, and it's pretty consistent, and that is uh, pregnancies coming off of sea duty that were on sea duty, uh, got pregnant, and then rolled to shore duty. We don't track those on sea duty or on shore duty, and the other is limited duty. So... I think that's a cost of doing business, right? We're going to have about 8,000. We need to be a service where sailors can get hurt, get injured, have surgery, what have you, go limb do for a period of time, and then come back to service. And we need to be a service where sailors can get pregnant, go have children, and come back to service. And that's the tax, if you will, for that is about 8,000 sailors uh, at any given point in time, okay? Next slide. 
This is the challenge of our day in PERS 40. So when I talk about those competing interests of sailor choice and needs of the Navy, that works out pretty well if I've got the right inventory of sailors. If I've got enough people in the Navy, and what this slide shows you here is fit gaps and fill gaps. So fill gaps, the, the red line, is a pretty high number right now. And, and fill gaps is, uh, I'm sorry, fit gaps is the red line. Uh, that basically means that I've got a sailor in a command, but not necessarily the right type of sailor. Um, fit gaps or fill gaps um, are, are basically a measure of inventory. So we've got two metrics that we're using in, in coordination with Fleet Forces Command, fit and fill. It's a little bit different than the DERS end readiness reporting, but it pretty well approximates that. What this tells you right now is that we've got roughly 8,000 fill gaps right now. That means that, at, and this is just at sea duty, okay? So there are gaps on shore duty as well, but I'm just looking at the lens of sea duty. So I'm looking at it from a man the fleet. So 8,000 fill gaps and roughly 15,000 fit gaps. That's our challenge. And what that means is, is that when a sailor goes into CMSID and is looking for jobs, sometimes the sailor's not going to see jobs that align with sailor's choice, okay? Because we don't have enough distributable inventory. That's just the plain facts of it. Sometimes it, it works out well, and it, de it depends, obviously, very specific to rating, PRD, uh, locations, all those sorts of things, but it, it certainly restricts our sailors' choice uh, in that regard. This is the challenge. Uh, on a good note, though, if you notice, both of those curves are kind of flattening off, and they're going to start to correct back in the, cor in the right direction, okay? Which goes to our next slide. So CNP has what we would refer to as levers, uh, and levers that he can use to basically influence the distributable inventory and uh, uh, where our sailors are in the fleet. And, and basically right now, every lever that CNP has has been moved to the maximum extent. Um, there's great work going on with BUPERS 3 in extending sailors that have an EOS out to their prescribed sea tour. That's bought us about 2,000, that's about 2,000 sailors worth of gaps that we've been able to buy back by authorizing sailors to extend to their prescribed sea tour. Sailors that otherwise would have gone under seaway and then been a denied final action and sent home, okay? The sailor benefits because the sailor gets more runtime now in seaway, more opportunity to get that seaway quota, and we certainly benefit because if, if we don't keep that sailor to PST, that's, that's another gap out there, okay? Um, that's a big one. Modifications of the higher tenure program. You know, that recently just came out via NAV admin and all of the uh, E6 and below have all been extended a couple of years. That's a significant impact to the Navy as well. And that equals more uh, sailors in the fleet and fewer gaps than we would have if we didn't do that. Uh, recently there was another NAV admin that went out and this was about E739, so our chief petty officer distribution. You know, every year we make roughly 4,000 chief petty officers. Matter of fact, just fr last Friday, we pinned about 50 of them in Millington, and I love going to that ceremony. It's one of the, my favorite things in the Navy because it's so unique to the Navy, and it's so fundamental to our long-term success. The only problem with that is those chief petty officers aren't where we need them to be, right? So we make 4,000 on, on one day. We pin them all. Based on their performance, it's certainly a merit-based process, but they're not where we need them to be. And where do we really need them to be? We really need Chief Petty Officer leadership at sea. I would tell you from coming from sea commands, the strength of my chief's mess is really hinged upon the strength of the overall command. Fundamental to the execution of everything you're trying to do at sea. And if you look at where we're going in the future, we're going to be increasing accessions here in the next year, the next couple of years, right? So when we increase accessions, what does that mean? It means we've got more junior sailors coming out into the fleet, right? If your chief's messes aren't fully manned, I'm not sure we're going to do as good a job as we could at retaining, training, mentoring those brand new sailors that are coming into the Navy. I think we owe it to them, and um, so that policy is getting put in place. Matter of fact, the detailers that aren't here and the placement officers that aren't here are working that problem right now. We just got uh, essentially a number of, of roughly 2,000 that we submitted uh, for reassignment, and we're going through that process right now. CM, uh, CNP mentioned that we just changed the CMSID window. So 
that's taken effect now, and this is pretty interesting. The way we had been doing it, uh, in simple terms, we had roughly a thousand sailors to fill a thousand billets, and I'll, I'll explain kind of the methodology in that in, the, in a second. But that's a little restricted in terms of there's a thousand sailors, it's not a thousand sailors that can fill a thousand of those billets, right? We're sliced into what I call a whole bunch of mini markets, right? We're sliced by pay, grant, pay band, and we're also sliced by rating. So if you look at all the rating styrations that we have and the different pay bands that we have, that makes a pretty complex process in there to get those, all those little mini markets. What we're doing by changing the CMS ID window is we're doubling the thickness of the market that it will improve sailor choice, it'll improve time and coordination between all the key stakeholders, and we'll get a decision sooner in the process as well. I mean, we believe that this is an incremental step into where we see the marketplace detailing going in the future, and I'll talk about some of those uh, initiatives in a moment. Uh, we also have a, a, a NAV admin that's coming out here soon, and this is adjustment of the soft EAOS to PRD. So if you, if you understand this, and probably most of you do, this is a fundamental challenge that we have, because when we figure out what billets need to be filled, I have to know when a sailor's going to leave. But if a sailor has an EOS prior to a PST or a PRD, we know about half of our sailor, first tour sailors get out. So that's telling me that demand signal that I have isn't necessarily accurate. So we're doing uh, some initiatives to try to, to make that demand signal more accurate. And from my perspective, as per, as per as four, if we had EOS stacked up with PRD 100% of the time, we would now have a 100% accurate demand signal in the fleet with the exception of unplanned losses, you know, emergent limb due type things or legal issues, okay? Um, and that's a, a big issue. And then there's the voluntary sea duty program. I put that last because it's not really a very uh, significant number of sailors that volunteer for that, but it does help. And every sailor that volunteers to go back to sea early helps us. Next slide, please. So this is the, the cycle of enlisted distribution. And, and it's drawn this way, and I'm going to kind of start talking about this from the point that I was just making about the demand signal. This really all starts with, when is a sailor going to roll? And across the Navy, that fits into, I've got a population of sailors that are going to roll out of jobs. In the case of filling sea duty, we're generally looking at my roller pool from shore duty to sea duty. So let's say I've got 1,000 jobs are a thousand sailors that are rolling from shore duty. That's what's referred to as my roller pool, okay? I just showed you a slide that shows I've got roughly 8,000 gaps in the fleet, and there's more gaps that develop because of the rollers that are, that are happening there. So there's a prioritization process that goes in here with us and Fleet Forces Command that now looks at the roller pool by rating, by pay grade, and now prioritizes the thousand jobs plus a little bit of extra that marries up or mirrors the, the roller pool. Do you understand that concept? That's, that's a fundamental aspect of this. So there, there's roughly 10,000 gaps out there in this example I'm giving you, but we're prioritizing the top thousand of them that match that roller pool. That's how sometimes we get misalignment between, hey, there's a job over here that I know is gapped, I'd love to go to do this job, Yes, true, but it's not a priority job, okay? And that priority is based on needs of the Navy, our operational deployers. And when we have gaps at sea, we try very hard to make sure that the gaps are not on operational units, not during deployments, not at our FDNF units. We try to make those gaps align mostly with units that are in the maintenance phases or in other uh, non-operational periods of, uh, of their cycle. So if you look at that, that demand signal getting set, and then you see where PERS 4013 is, and we kind of coordinate that with the MCA over in the far right corner, and then all of that gets entered into CMS ID. Sailors go and apply inside the CMS ID, which by the way, CMS ID is a marketplace, right? I mean, sailors go into there, they can see what jobs are being advertised. They're not getting to, to see every job in the Navy because we're, seeing, we're showing prioritized jobs. Okay, but they get to see jobs, and they get to vote on a choice, 
and the commands get to vote on the applicants for those jobs. So the commands in billet-based distribution, which is a sub-module inside CMSID, get a vote. All that then goes to the detailer who ultimately makes a selection. And if you're the detailer, sometimes you're talking to constituents about jobs, sometimes you're just looking at a computer screen where you've got five applicants for a job. And the detailer is looking at the applicants, the skills of the applicants, the comments from the commands that they entered or didn't enter, okay, and, that, and I'll touch on that in a moment, um, and then making a decision. So that's how that process works. And then the sailor gets selected, gets notified, and then we kind of start the cycle all over again, okay? Next slide. This is the detailing timeline, and I really just put this up here as a, a quick snap to show over in the green area, that's where all the great work that commands are doing. That's where we have our, our career counselors, that's where we have our commands engaging with sailors, career development boards, that's where we're essentially investing, and that's not just in the green, obviously, that spans the entire period, but that's where you're, you're setting sailors up for success. You're helping them make decisions and good choices, you're talking about options, you might even want to be engaging through the command career counselor to talk to folks in Millington about opportunities. And then once the sailor gets in the yellow, now we're in the, in the period of competing in the CMSID window. Again, just change that so it's now a six-month period with three selection points at two-month blocks. And then once you get inside the red area, it becomes needs of the Navy. And I think it's also important to tell you, and you probably understand this, though, in a very constrained market with the gaps that we have, sailors sometimes do not get a choice. I mean, if you have a unique skill, if you're rolling at a particular time and there's a unique need in the fleet, it may very well be, hey, shipmate, this is where we need you to go. And that is essentially a 100% needs of the Navy uh, offer, if you will. And um, I know sometimes that's hard to sell, but that's the tougher part of our business, okay? And I think I need to be fully upfront with you, and I think our detailers are upfront with you as well, okay? Next slide, please. So how do commands and chief's messes help this process. I would tell you career development boards. I've been blessed throughout my career and had just phenomenal command career counselors. When I was on Ford last, I had Master Chief Garland. Uh, he's off doing command Master Chief work right now. Phenomenal. The most energetic CM, uh, NC I think I've ever seen. He led the most aggressive CDB uh, process I've ever seen. He carried out commander's intent, command climate and command culture all the way through the stack with the sailors and made it crystal clear that we needed them, we wanted them, and we would do everything in our power to keep them in the Navy and help them advance and give them all the right guidance and tools along the way. And the amazing thing to me is, over the course of my tour there, I had so many senior petty officers to include some chiefs come into the command, and you know what they said? Hey, I've never had a career development board before. You know, so to CNP's point, when we talk about things like counseling, career development boards, it's not consistently applied across the board. But I would tell you, if you go and you look at the best commands in the Navy, the best commands in the Navy are investing heavily in career development boards. And as chief petty officers, as commanding officers, XOs, CMCs, you know, you show up and you sit on one of those, you don't have to say much, you just have to sit and observe. You know that old adage, that which interests my boss fascinates me, right? If the boss is interested in that, guess what? The level of engagement in the command is going to go up. This is an enormously important aspect if we want to keep our best and brightest in the Navy. Review BBD. This is an enormously important aspect as well. So when I talk about the accuracy of the demand signal, right, knowing what sailor is in what billet sequence code at what PRD, right? We call that the alignments, right? So a sailor gets advanced, right? So you got a, a third class petty officer makes second class, awesome. Is that sailor in the right billet now? Not unless you move them to the right billet, not unless you properly align them. This is a fundamental aspect to if you want your priority billets in your command to be advertised and to get the right prioritization in that requisition process that I talked about, you got to know where the sailors are. And if your command's out of whack in that regard, you're not going to help your chances. 
uh, express manning concerns from a command perspective through the placement coordinator, the ISIC, and the TICOM. You can do that through EMERS, you can do that through PERSMARS. I'm a big fan of the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? If you're the squeaky wheel, guess what? You're probably going to be a little higher on the prioritization. Now, my staff might not like hearing that necessarily, but, you know, if there's problems with your manning, in particular, if there's problems with manning that, that kind of go beyond just the numbers, and I'll give you an example. Let's say you have, uh, I don't know, 18 of 20 chiefs. You're at 90%. That's not too bad. What if the commanding officer's assessment of that chief's mess, that 18 of 20 is, ah, this is kind of weak. Maybe they're not gelling the right way. Those are things that we need to hear about. Because there's a quality aspect to this. It's much, much more than numbers. When we talk fit and fill, we're really looking at an Excel spreadsheet. We're looking at a calculation of a percentage or numbers. There is certainly a quality aspect to this. Um, all of us in this room should be familiar with CMSID. Our command career counselors need to teach this to sailors. I don't think it's something that's uh, too terribly difficult, but it does take a little bit of runtime and practice and experience and leadership and mentoring to teach our sailors how to properly use CMSID. And if sailors don't make choices, because a sailor's going to have three windows to make five choices in each window, if a sailor doesn't make a choice, that does not mean that they will not get picked, right? So if there's nothing advertised that they, don't, that they like, selecting nothing does not necessarily mean you won't get picked that cycle, and then you go into the next cycle. Ideally, it will. And when our marketplace gets healthier and we get more distributable inventory, that will benefit sailors much more. And again, I think I've talked enough about the command career counselors, but from my perspective, fundamental to creating a command climate and a culture of excellence, of retention, of treating people with respect and dignity. Command career counselor is a vital, vital node for that. Next slide, please. This is a part that's really exciting. CNP talked to me about this, and we've got a very unique time, I think, in our Navy where CNO recognizes that this transition really from an industrial age to a technology age means that we have to change the way we do business about innovation. Historically, over my 30 years, innovation was not necessarily a very fast process. It was pretty slow. You'd come up with an idea, you'd get a working group, you'd get a study, you'd get analysis, you'd get plans and all that sort of thing. And by the time it got anywhere near executing, you'd probably be rolling on to another job and handing it over to somebody else that may or may not have the same vision or passion for that. Today, the appetite for uh, what I would call disruptive innovation is like I've never seen before. We've got an appetite for it, um, and there are all kinds of initiatives out there right now. CNP went into great detail on the fitness report, which I didn't put up here because I knew he was going to talk about, but I do want to make one point about it. Another aspect of improvements to the fit rep process if you just think about this, on the enlisted side, our evaluations, when I say enlisted, E5 and below, really, data from the eval goes into a computer, into an algorithm, and it informs the selection process for advancement. It's not all that. It's one of the factors, right? I mean, basically, it, it spits out a number. There's kind of a, a cut line that a computer generates, and you're either advanced or you're not advanced. At the chief petty officer, information off of fit reps and other records are mined, if you will, manually mined by the board. So they go in and they, they capture things, assign values, and essentially manually calculate points because it's not readily accessible through data fields. And what do they do is they calculate numbers, draw a cut line. If you're above the cut line, you're in. If you're below the cut line, maybe next year. And on the officer side, we don't really have a very good ability to manually mine things. It's, I think it's very objective. It's a very fair process. But we want a system that is very data rich and has an ability to mine data and better capture performance, um, grit, um, potential, those sorts of things, and factor that into the selection process for advancement or for jobs when we talk about marketplace detailing. All this, though, all these great innovations hinges upon IT transformation. I worked in Millington, I think it was 17 years ago, 
and the same ancient software that we had 17 years ago is in place today. 17 years ago, it was old, and today it's, it's older, right? Uh, we've made some marginal improvements over time, and I would tell you that CMSID and billet-based distribution are, are two very good ones. But on the officer side, and, and at, for the bulk part, there's not been much in the way of improvement. And there's no authoritative database out there. So we've got all kinds of systems, um, medical reporting, uh, CMSID, Seaway, all these com different systems that basically have their own separate databases. That's being consolidated. That's the foundation that we've got to have in order to be able to do all these next generation uh, things. But this is, again, I think very exciting. Marketplace detailing. Uh, again, CMSID is like that to an extent. The marketplace is a little broken. We want to include talent. We want to include grit. We want to include potential. Uh, improve the, the distributable inventory. We want to incentivize sailors to go to the jobs that we need to do, which is tailored compensation, right? We think of, of compensation or incentives largely today as what? SRBs, SDIP, OTIP, uh, those sorts of things, financial. We don't do a very good job. Matter of fact, I would tell you we don't do much of a job at all of non-cash incentives. What if the incentive was take these orders and we'll keep you in this location for the next tour? That has value to people. How much value? I can't tell you. But we've got to expand the IT stuff in order to be able to do things like that. Um, and that's why I think this is a very exciting time because I, I won't mention the other initiatives that we're working on right now, but there are more things that we're working on, more initiatives to improve this and to demonstrate things like tailored compensation. Another one is contracted tours. If you look at the way we do business today, a sailor re-enlists, right, for X number of years, may or may not get an SRB, and then they get assigned to a tour. Is that tour aligned with that sailor's contract? No, it's not. So what do we do? Our policy automatically drives into the system this mismatch between EAOS and PRD. And that's problematic for us, because now if we don't have an accurate demand signal, the whole system starts to crumble on the margins, and it makes it harder and harder for us to fill the critical billets that we need to. This excites me, because there is an appetite for an initiative like I've never seen, and uh, my team will tell you, I, I think all of them are in, working in multiple working groups right now, uh, where we are looking at a whole host of things. We work very, very closely with BUPERS 3, which is the community management side of the house, uh, you'll get a brief from uh, Vinny here shortly, um, but we work kind of naturally aligned, if you think about it, distribution and community management. Uh, next slide. I think that was about the end of my brief. Um, I don't know when you got the hook, but I think you got some questions. Yes, sir. So what I'd like to do is get you a couple questions that we've gotten on Poll EV, and then during the flag panel, We'll give a chance to ask some of the other questions also for you to walk up to the mic if you'd prefer to ask a question that way. But uh, we're going to display a question. The first question has to do with issues with uh, communication between the detailers and an accountability question for you to answer, sir. So why are detailers not held accountable for not giving their sailors the attention they deserve? My detailers not return any calls or emails in four months. Uh, I use my chain of command. So I would hold detailers accountable for that if I had more accurate information. And if the, whoever sent the question in can give me the, the data on that, uh, I'd be happy to, to look into that personally. So I've got PERS 40 here. Um, I think, by and large, I think our detailers are very responsive. I will not make an excuse, but I'll tell you that the average detail has somewhere in the area of 1,500 to 2,000 constituents. Uh, they're not necessarily all emailing them at the same time. Some detailers have more than that, some have less. Um, and getting a hold of detailers who are doing things like this and others can sometimes be a challenge, but there's no excuse for four months of uh, going without communication. So I, I can work on that, and Chris, if you can get me the details on, or get a follow-up on, on some of the specifics, I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. If the person who put that in, if we can have you contact Captain Ross, up here uh, during one of the breaks, we'll we'll address that uh, directly. Hey, Oscar, can directly I directly uh, and anonymously? Too, Oscar, so. can I pile in on that? Yes, one? sir. Hey, this is another one where uh, you know got a bunch of commanding officers, XOs, command master chiefs in here. The, we need your help. Call 
that detail or supervisors get it into Oscar's shop. If we don't have the specifics, you know, we just can't do anything with it. When we get the specifics, Oscar and Purse 40, those guys will go hold folks accountable. It's back to the squeaky wheel thing, and one of Oscar's points up front here was, you know, people that have worked at the Bureau don't hesitate to work the phones on behalf of their people. So pick up the phone, write emails, talk to the detail or supervisors, understand the Bureau, which is not easy to do. One of the things we talked about yesterday on My Navy Portal, we're going to put all the numbers in the directory. We can't put names, there's PII reasons, but we're going to put a much more detailed directory on My Navy Portal, on My Navy Portal one-stop shopping so you don't have to drill into 15 different places to get it. It'll get much easier to navigate, but help us help you by just calling, giving us the details when your sailors aren't getting the response they deserve. So thank you. It's a great question. And so I think that also CMP answered the next question that we were to display, which had to do with contacting detailers and getting that information out. So with that, if we can show the next question then. I, I will offer to CMP's point that senior officers don't have any qualms contacting me directly about things like that. And uh, every time they do, I immediately drill down on the, on the point, so. So if we can go ahead and bring up the next question we've got on poll EV here. Okay, do, do we have any others queued up immediately? Ready Anybody in the audience want to ask a question? It doesn't all have to be online. Did you have one? Oh, you're scratching? Sir, we, we do have one up yeah. on the screen about match and PRD. Yeah, with EOS the start PRD. of matching EOS and PRD, are, are, are we looking at not using PERSMARS anymore? I don't know. I might have to defer to uh, PERS 40 or BU PERS 3 on that. Uh, Al, you got a thought on that? We're, we're continuing to do the PERSMARS tools with the different placements. Okay. Okay, so the answer for anybody who's online, maybe not, didn't hear that. When we talk about aligning EOS and PRD, that nav admin's not out, but that is important. It's kind of in the, in the conga line working its way to CNP. And uh, as we work through that, we'll uh, continue to look at the PERSMARS and whether we need to keep those alive, so. Uh, 